Hello everybody and welcome to the first real video lecture of uh, Social Equation Modeling 1 uh, on confirmatory effect analysis. And in this video lecture I'll talk a bit about the basics behind measurement in psychology about psychometrics and about uh, factor analysis and um, what we do under the hood in the software. We're not actually going to use software yet this week, uh, but you'll understand the basics about scaling of latent variables, model identification, and what's actually happening and how we uh, fit the model. So after this lecture, um, you should understand uh, most of the basics. And next week, we'll talk about actually fitting a model in software and seeing if a model that you uh, hypothesize fits or not. So first, I want to talk a bit about psychometrics. Uh, psychometrics is the field that uh, I'm in. It's uh, quite a big field of research. And it's concerned with the measurement of psychological properties um, or psychological constructs. Usually we uh, refer to these constructs as latent variables, and uh, that's also what I do in, uh, in this course as well. Uh, so this is the field uh, that's concerned with measuring things. And this could be uh, anything, like for example, personality traits, cognitive skills, abilities, uh, psychological disorders, types, uh, mood states, uh, things like that. A very large part of psychometrics is focused on education, on testing ability. Uh, for example, uh, central exams in the Netherlands, uh, they're made by the CITO, which is a big uh, institute with a big psychometric group. And there, the, the question is, how do you do this uh, as, as good as possible? How do you measure people and their abilities? How do you know which, uh, if people are, um, uh, are ready to go to university? Uh, things like that. But also in other fields of psychology, psychometrics plays a very important part. Because usually, the things that we're interested in psychology are things we cannot directly measure. Usually, people are not interested in hypotheses at the, at the item level, at things you can ask, but hypotheses at latent levels, at uh, underlying constructs. For example, you might want to know if groups differ on their level of uh, neuroticism or not, their level of uh, depression or not. Of course, then you need to uh, assume that uh, that exists, that there is a latent variable like uh, neuroticism or extroversion or depression. That's a whole different discussion, actually, uh, that you might have heard about as well if you're interested in the level analysis and things like that. I'll come back to that more in SEM2. Uh, so for now, we are, we are going to assume these uh, traits exist and that we want to measure them and that we want to compare groups on these kinds of variables. So uh, let's take a step back first and think about uh, how do we measure something. So what is measurement? So measurement is, um, uh, is the ability to quantify a construct into two numbers that we can use in in statistics or in, in, in science. So for example, we might want to measure temperature. And if we want to measure temperature, we need to get a, a number that says uh, how hot or how cold it is. But how do you measure temperature? What is temperature? So one way that you can measure temperature is by looking at a, a thermometer. right? So we have a thermometer and um, I'm, I'm not actually familiar exactly with how thermometers work, but I believe there's a quicksilver in there and it expands when it gets hotter. So um, then the more it expands, the hotter it is. And then these uh, devices are quite reliable. And then we can uh, read off the temperature from the thermometer. So what's actually happening there? Well, for that to make sense, we need to make some very basic assumptions because the thermometer is not temperature, right? It's, it's, it's a thing. It has like stuff in there. We have an electronic thermometer that has different stuff in there. So we need to make some very important uh, assumptions. The first one is that temperature, the thing that we're actually interested in, which is out there in the world, um, causes the level shown on the thermometer. So that is, we need to assume that this thing goes up and down as a function of uh, temperature itself. Second is that uh, this device is quite reliable, that it doesn't has a lot, have a lot of measurement error. And with that I mean that if I measure, uh, if I look at the temperature, a thermometer now, and I look at it again uh, at it in, uh, in a minute or in five minutes, I should get roughly the same values. 
Now with these assumptions uh, in check, we could start forming a, uh, a costly hypothesized model. Uh, and to do that, uh, we can actually draw our model using a path diagram uh, to uh, avoid having to use uh, mathematical expressions for this, we'd rather make it uh, a nice uh, diagram with, with arrows and, uh, and circles and boxes. So in this uh, causal diagram, uh, we represent uh, latent variables, things we do not observe, with circles, or in this case, a sun. So here we have one latent variable, which is the actual true temperature. And here we have a second one, we can interpret this thing as latent variable as well, which is what we call a residual or a measurement error. Um, so this is uh, things or deviations on the temperature thermometer that are not due to the actual underlying latent variable. Square nodes, or in this case a rectangular node, indicate observed variables. So in this case we have here this one observed thermometer. These are also called indicators of the latent variable. Now, unidirectional uh, arrows, so those are arrows with only one direction, indicate causal effects. So we have two here. And bidirectional arrows, which are these uh, blue arrows over here, indicate variances or covariances. And these are very important on the latent variables because there must be an actual variance in, uh, the, in, in temperature. Right, so temperature differs over places in the world or differs over time. Likewise, the residual error should also have a variance because um, you get a different result. If you have no variance here, you just have a constant bias and there's not much you can do with it. Now the nice thing about this, um, uh, about, uh, this path diagram is that we can actually read off our causal hypothesis here. And that is that the thermometer is a function, let's say, let's, let's use the equal sign here, or let's use the function here. So it's a function of the true temperature and the error, the epsilon. And in fact, we're going to uh, use only a linear expression for these functions where all these arrows here indicate uh, regression weights. Okay, so let's uh, get rid of uh, some uh, uh, suns and, uh, and other pictures and uh, instead uh, use Greek letters because in structural phase modeling or uh, confirmative effect analysis, everybody really loves Greek letters. Then here I actually have the exact same um, the exact same uh, model as I had before, but now I represent it a bit more uh, schematically. So I have the same thing, I have one latent variable, which is this eta, as we call it now, and we'll use eta for every latent variable that we are going to encounter in both SAM1 and SAM2. We have one residual, which is still called epsilon. We have one observed variable or indicator, which we call y, so y1 means the first indicator. And now we also put some Greek letters on these paths. So now we put a lambda here. Lambda will use for factor loadings. We put a psi here, and psi will use for the variance of the latent variable. And we put a theta here, and theta will use for the variance of the residual. And note there's also a one here that indicates that this effect is simply uh, one. There is no uh, actual regression here. So then, as I said before, uh, this translates to a regression model. You can see here that y equals, and then simply um, all incoming arrows um, multiplied by the node that they are incoming. So this says y equals, okay, I have two incoming arrows, so equals one thing plus another thing. Here, this is one a lambda, so lambda times eta. That's lambda times eta plus Another incoming arrow, one, so that's nothing here, it should be one here, times epsilon. And that's what this says. Then um, we are going to further assume that everything that we encounter, all variables that we encounter, are normally distributed, which is this n here. And for now, also that the mean of the latent variable is zero, 
the residual lint variable will always be zero because we're not going to assume any uh, constant bias. And then these uh, variances here are the variances of the model. So the square root of a variance is the standard deviation. So this says eta has a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a variance of the square root of psi. And epsilon is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of the square root of uh, theta. And that's a way that we can use this uh, graphical model to portray the mathematical expressions. Now, one thing that's important to uh, note here is that this graphical model has uh, arrowheads that are directed and they imply a causal relationship. And we should also interpret this equal sign as a um, uh, causal factor. So that means that these are not really symmetric relationships. So that means we cannot just put this on the left side that you can normally do if you're solving an equation. Everything that's on the right side has to stay on the right side, and everything on the left side has to stay on the left side. That uh, it's not really important for this course, but it will be more important in uh, SEM2. Now, a nice thing about uh, these expressions is that we can use them to um, also obtain expressions for the variance and the covariance that's implied by the model. And uh, that's a very important uh, point in psychometrics, as I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, the way we do that is by using um, expectation al algebra and variance covariance algebra. You might have learned about this in a previous course. Uh, this is pretty important for SEM, but I'm not going to teach about it now. So in SEM 2, the first lecture, we'll do a prequel to SEM 1, if you will. And there I'm going to teach you about covariance algebra, where you can derive these expressions yourself. Now I'm simply... Uh, giving them. So this model here, this graphical model here, implies this set of equations, where this says y equals lambda times eta plus epsilon. This says eta is normally distributed, and this says epsilon is normally distributed. And with this equation, I can derive that the variance of y1 so the variance I should obtain if I just have y1 with an observed variable and I do far, like far y1 in r, for example, should be structured in this way. It should be lambda squared times psi, the variance of the Lenz variable, plus the variance of the residual. And with this expression, we can do something. So for example, we can look at how much uh, of the variance is explained by the latent variable simply by taking the part that is due to the latent variable and dividing it by the total variance. So here we have the part that is due to the latent variable and we divide it by the total variance. And if this is one, that means that uh, this is near zero, the residual variance, and that means that the latent variable perfectly explains the uh, observed uh, variable, which uh, would be a nice thing because then we have a good strong indicator that has little relative measurement error. Now, this is nice, but there is uh, uh, there are some complications. And one is that our latent variable is, as the name implies, latent. We haven't observed it. And that means uh, also that we don't know the scale of the latent variables. Or rather, the unit. We don't know the unit of the latent variable. So uh, we can measure our temperature with a thermometer, and the thermometer might be in some unit, like Celsius or Fahrenheit, um, but we don't know uh, what the true temperature is. Like actually, true temperature doesn't have a unit. So that's a weird thing. But this could be in Fahrenheit instead of in Kelvin or in Celsius or any other uh, unit that you can think of, and it doesn't really really matter what it's in. So uh, if this is in Fahrenheit, then this uh, weight here and an intercept on this uh, uh, term meter that I'm not drawing here, that would simply be uh, different, but we would get the exact same fit. We get the same, um, we would get the same uh, explained variance of uh, of temperature on our um, 
thermometer, for example. And that's because this thing is latent, so by definition we don't know it, we can't know the unit. So, uh, and that's a problem. So we need to identify the unit or the scale of the latent variable. And that means that we need to place the distribution of the latent variable uh, somewhere. So we need to specify the mean and the variance of the latent variable. And with that I mean, let's say we have a, uh, the, we, we put eta on the scale and uh, we have the distribution. We need to set a, a center point of the distribution and we need to set the width of the distribution. And then we can define, okay, eta is here. And uh, if we have defined these two center points, then we can obtain these uh, these weights, these um, regression weights, and uh, uh, things like that. So in uh, IQ, for example, this is set to 100. And the standard deviation is set to uh, 15. So this area here would be times uh, 2. Because this is two standard deviations, usually, if it is 95%. Um, so that's uh, an important uh, uh, aspect. Normally we don't know a, a, a unit. And this is true not only for our uh, construct, it's true actually for everything that we want to measure. Uh, so the way that in physics they uh, solve this is by uh, uh, having very strongly defined uh, what they call base units. And until last year, a kilogram, for example, was literally defined as, uh, as the weight of this kilogram, which was like held in Paris, I think, uh, very uh, uh, closely guarded. And the weight of this thing was a kilogram. So that's how they defined the unit of, the, of, of weight. Uh, I think now they have a better measure for it, but uh, it's only last year that it's actually officially changed. So that means that if this thing became uh, heavier, which can happen because things can get more heavy or less heavy in, uh, uh, in the world, uh, even uh, metal. Um, if this came heavier, it actually uh, this did not become heavier, but the entire world became a bit lighter. And everything that we mentioned became relatively lighter because this thing was a kilogram. So uh, this is always a kilogram. Um, a similar thing that you have uh, that's similar to this is the Flynn effect in intelligence, where uh, if you compare a generation to previous generation, actually intelligence goes up. So within a generation, intelligence is defined as having a mean of 100. So uh, in a generation, you wouldn't see that effect because uh, it can't happen. <coughs> okay, so uh, we need to define the unit of the latent variable. And to do this, we need to, uh, as we call, scale the latent variable. And uh, the main problem is that um, if we don't scale the latent variable, we have an identification problem, which means that our expression for the implied variance of y uh, is not identified. It's explained uh, uh, here. We can go back to our expression that we had before. Here we have the variance of y. And basically we could make this factor loading a bit bigger and the variance of the latent variable a bit smaller to get the exact same um, or this one actually, to get the exact same fit. So if you increase this lambda and we make it psi a bit smaller, we get the exact same implied variance. So there are infinite number of possible values for lambda and psi that would lead to the same implied variance. And that's an identification problem. So what do we do to resolve that identification problem? That is, we have to um, fix something. We have to basically fix the width of the latent distribution. And we can do that in two ways. We can say, okay, we're not going to estimate psi, but we're going to say this is 1 or 15 in the case of, uh, of um, the um, in the case of the IQ, right? But we are going to just say 1 for now. Let's say uh, the variance is 1. Then we made the width of the distribution uh, a fixed point. Later, in week three, we will also specify the mean of the latent variable. But now we already said the mean is uh, zero, 
So that's already identified, so we're not going to bother with that now. So this is one option that we can do it. The other option would be, okay, we're going to estimate this uh, variance, but, oh, there you go. We're going to estimate this latent variance, but we are going to fix this, and we're going to say this factor loading is one. And now what we did is we said that the unit of the latent variable is actually similar to the unit of the observed variable because this is one. So now if the observed variable say temperature in, uh, in Celsius, then that means the latent variable is also uh, temperature in a scale that's close to Celsius. Uh, so that gives us a more interpretable, um, interpretable uh, value here. And we have to choose one of these two. So we have to choose either the factor variance or the factor loading that we constrain to some value. And then we get a, um, uh, then we scale the latent variable. And this is important. Um, throughout the course, uh, usually the software does this automatically, but this is always important to remember that, okay, we, whenever we do a latent variable model, we have a latent variable, we need to scale the latent variable, so we need to place some constraints, so we either need to constrain a factor loading or the latent variable variance. Okay, so then we defined the unit, so we came, uh, got over our uh, identification problem, but um, we'll, as we'll see, we'll have more problems still that we need to uh, get over before we can actually do something. And this is a general problem in uh, latent variables uh, or in uh, psychometrics, um, because let's say we have a latent variable like this, you would think to think that we're interested in is measuring this eta. And actually, I've been saying, okay, psychometrics is about uh, measurement and measuring of latent constructs. But actually, it turns out that that's not entirely accurate. Maybe the endpoint is, but uh, for the most part, we actually can get around by uh, not uh, estimating this latent variable um, directly. It's weird. <clears throat> so this is actually a, a major issue in psychometrics. Okay, we have these latent variables, and we might want to estimate them. But for any statistical, uh, multivariate statistical model to work, we need to be able to uh, increase data. So, um, for example, uh, 100 people is a, a, a relatively big data set, actually quite small for factor analysis. But 1,000 people is better, and a million people is even better. And ideally, we want to have our estimates and our parameter estimation uh, working in a way that the more data we add, uh, add the more precise estimates we get for our parameters. Um, now a problem is that um, we can add data in two ways. So we can add items, for example, we can add multiple questions, or we can add people. Yeah, if you have a cross-sectional data set. If you have a longitudinal data set, I talked a bit about it in SEM2, we can add time as well, and multiple measurements, but that's basically comparable to adding uh, people, you just add more cases. But the problem is if we add an item, we also add a factor loading that we need to estimate. Um, so uh, we actually make our problem more complicated. And if we have a million items, we have a million factor loadings to estimate, and that has a very complicated problem, and we're not going to get better estimates because everything we do, we make our model more compl complicated. If we instead add people, and we want to estimate the latent variables as well, then every person we add, we also add a latent variable we need to estimate, namely the value of that person, which would also make the model more complicated. So if you have a million people, you would have to estimate a million latent variables, and uh, we can't really do that. So that's a big issue actually in, in psychometrics, and it's also a bit uh, paradoxical. So paradoxically, the first step in psychometrics that you usually do when you are modeling these kinds of latent variables is to actually get rid of the latent variable, which is completely bizarre, but this is what happens in confirmatory effect analysis, in structural equation modeling, and confirmatory effect analysis is just a special case of structural equation modeling, but also in um, item response theory. So how do we do that? 
uh, in item response theory you might have heard about it if you don't then it's not very important for this course it's the binary uh, version of uh, factor analysis if you will uh, one thing you can do is integrate out the latent variable just um, you uh, basically look at the marginal distribution of the latent variable but in factor analysis we can do a, a bit uh, easier method and there we can make use of covariance modeling and what we do in covariance modeling is that we don't model um, look at the model per individual, so we don't try to estimate a eta per every person, but instead we first look at the variance covariance structure, so the correlation structure of a data set, and then see uh, what um, variance covariance structure is implied by our, uh, our model, and how that, uh, and then we estimate parameters such that the implied variance covariance structure is equal to the, or is closely related to the observed variance covariance structure. And by doing that, we don't have to estimate anymore a latent variable per person, we just have to estimate one variance of the latent variable, and not even that if you have already constrained it. Um, and a very powerful um, method is this, that uh, we can actually test most hypotheses we're interested in using only this uh, covariance modeling. So it turns out we don't actually need estimates for these latent variables to test things. If I want to compare two groups on, um, let's say, their level of neuroticism, I don't need to take a sum score of neuroticism uh, items or anything and then compare them using a t-test. I can use such equation modeling directly without ever having to estimate these latent variables per person. If I want to see if my measurement model fits, I don't need to um, uh, compute these um, uh, scaled factors. I can just do it directly via the coping structure as well. If I want to test if one latent variable might cause another one, so that's what we'll see in SEM2, we're going to make models like, like this, and you might want to test a mediation effect like this, then we can directly test if um, the variance coping structure can be structured in such a way that's in line with this model, and we don't need to have estimates per person for these measures. So we don't need to have like some scores and then uh, do some model. And that's very powerful. But that's what we are going to do in this course. <coughs> okay, so back to our uh, example. So what we are going to do in factor analysis is we're going to match the observed variances and covariances. So uh, let's say we have one variable here, right? We have one observed variable. Then we only have one variance that we observe. There's no covariance because we only have one item. So we only have one variance, the variance of y, one value. We're going to match this to the parameters, which are in blue. In this case, I used the uh, identification here of lambda equals one. So we have two parameters, a residual variance and a latent variance. And now we don't no longer need to estimate these latent variables themselves. So these, they're sort of out of the model. They're in there in the circle, but we only model the variance. We don't need to estimate uh, this eta for person one, person two, person three, or in this case, i here is person i. And uh, if we uh, find a set of parameters um, such that it closely resembles in my observed uh, statistics, summary statistics, then we can say we uh, explain the data very well. And that's the, the general idea here. Okay, now you might already see uh, one complication with this, and that is that in this case we have one observed piece of information, but we have two parameters we need to estimate, a latent variance and an observed variance. All right, so this reads as A equals B plus C, where we know A, but we don't know B and C. And the problem now is that I can have any solution for B, it doesn't matter if I say B equals 100, then I can um, still uh, fill in C because uh, C then is, uh, let's say, let's see, um, 
uh, the difference right between 100 and whatever a is so this model is not identified we have two unknowns and one known and this means that we cannot find a solution for that that's unique there are only one uh, possible uh, parameter set uh, resembles this a as close as possible so that's a big problem we don't have an identified model here um, so still not, even though we uh, scaled the length variable and we defined the scaling, we defined uh, the width of the distribution, we still don't have an identified model because we have two things that we need to estimate, but we only have one thing that we have observed, namely this one variance. So what do we do? Uh, so in addition to scaling, we need to have what we call non-negative degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom are the amount of observations minus the amount of parameters. And until week three, we're not going to regard the mean, so we're only going to look at variance and covariances. So the amount of observations is the number of variances and covariances. In this case, we had A equals one, because we had one variance, that's all we observed. Then the number of parameters is the number of parameters we needed to estimate. In this case, those were two. We had uh, one variance of the latent variable, one variance of the residual, so two parameters. Now a way to also uh, calculate, well, calculate the number of observations that we need is by taking the number of variables, P, and then using this formula. It's a really nice formula that gives me the number of variances and covariances in a data set. So if P is 1, then this is 1 times 1 plus 1 divided by 2 equals 1. But if P is 2, then we have two variables. Then we have two variances and one covariance. We have 2 times 3 is 6 divided by 2 equals um, 3. So then we have three observations, namely two variances and one covariance. And it uh, goes up like that. Now, if we need to have an identified model, one of the most basic uh, and important rules that we need is we first need to fix the scaling. That's always important. And the second is we have to have non-negative degrees of freedom. So that means we must have at least as many observations, A, as we have parameters in the model, B. <coughs> so in the case we had before, we had uh, one observation, two parameters, so we had the degrees of freedom of minus one, and that's not good. We need at least zero. In practice, that, uh, to have these rules, we are going to see we need at least three indicators for a single latent variable, or if you have multiple latent variables, we need to have two per factor. And this is why in the final project, you need to have at least three indicators as well. So we need to have at least as many observed variance and covariances as we have parameters in the model. Right now, we have degrees of freedom of minus one. Even though we scaled the latent variable, we still don't have an identified model. So what can we do? We can add multiple indicators. And this is the main thing that we do in fact analysis. If we want to measure something and we want to take into account <coughs> that there is measurement error, so that the measurements are not perfect, we need to have multiple indicators of a constant. So we can add one, we have two indicators. So now things become a bit more complicated. Now, eta here, is a common cause. So it causes both y2 and y1. We scaled the latent variable by setting lambda 1 equals 1, but note that we can estimate the factor, uh, variance, uh, factor loading of the second uh, observed indicator because we already defined the scale of the uh, latent variable. We cannot just make this psi now twice as big, because this one will not um, 
uh, changed as well, and then uh, that will make an uh, implication of the variance of i1. We have two residuals as well. They both have a residual variance. Uh, so uh, one thing we also see in this model is that we're assuming a very important concept, local independence. And that is that there's no covariance between these residuals. So that means that we don't assume that these have a correlation. Um, and that means that any correlation between y1 and y2 is assumed to be due to the latent variable here. It's a very important concept in, in psychometrics. Okay, so we have a nice two indicator model now. So how many parameters do we have? We have one, uh, a factor variance, two, one factor loading, three, and four. And those are the residual variances. So we have four parameters. So how many pieces of information do we have? Well, we have two indicators. So we have two variances and one covariance between them. Right? If I have our variance covariance matrix, it's called S, we would have one, two, three unique elements. Another way is we can use our formula with P equals two, so then P times P plus one divided by two equals three. So the degrees of freedom is 4, uh, 3 minus 4 equals minus 1, which is bad, because uh, the model is still not identified. Okay, so then uh, we can add, uh, of course, more indicators. But at some point, this becomes very uh, tedious to write down per variable. So now I had to... Uh, write down here a expression for every uh, indicator separately and it just becomes a very big list at some point and uh, we don't want to do that we want to make things a bit uh, easier so the way we make things easier is by using matrix um, calculus or matrix uh, sorry not calculus algebra and in the uh, stats recap video i already explained a bit uh, some of the basics again about matrix multiplication. If you don't know that, then it's important to um, look into that so you get a, a bit of an idea of what's going on here. So now, instead of saying uh, y1 equals a function of, uh, like, like first I had like y1 equals lambda 1 times eta 1, etc., 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 we're not going to do that. We instead form everything in matrix expressions. So here we have y, but y person i is now a factor of responses. It might be three or four responses with y1, y2, y3, and y4. Lambda here is now not a value, but it's a matrix with a row for each indicator. Let's say uh, four rows. And if you have two latent variables, we have two columns. Or one latent variable is simply a factor with uh, one column. Eta is also a factor with an element for each latent variable. So now we have eta1, eta2. And epsilon is also a factor, in this case also with four elements, let's say that, with every uh, residual. And the nice thing about this matrix expression is that we can do things and we can just uh, formulate every possible factor model using this expression only um, without having to make all these small individual equations for every possible uh, indicator. Okay, so what do we have here? We have y, we have eta, we have epsilon, we have the factor variance covers matrix, then we have two more matrices, psi, which is the variance of the latent variable, and theta, which is the variance of the residual. So this is now a variance covariance matrix. So in the case of two latent variables, we have a two by two matrix. In the case of four indicators, we have a four 
by 4 matrix at theta. Usually theta has zeros on everything that's not the diagonal element. And then we just have the residual variances here on the diagonal. With subscripts here. Usually psi has, uh, is fully connected and they are symmetrical. So these are the same elements. So we're not going to bother uh, saying that latent variables not correlated. We're going to assume all latent variables are correlated. In SAM2, we're going to do more on this latent level and we're going to structure it a bit more. In SAM1, this is always just a matrix that's fully connected, uh, fully uh, populated. Theta usually has uh, zeros on everything that's not there. Now. Uh, in SEM2, you will learn the variance covariance algebra. And using covariance matrix, we can use this expression here to derive an expression for the variance of y. And the variance of y, y is now a vector. So the variance is a variance covariance matrix. So it's a big matrix with, for example, four, four by four matrix if you have four, um, four indicators. And we're going to call that sigma, capital sigma. Now using covariance algebra, we derive this expression. Sigma, the implied variance covariance matrix, equals lambda, the vector loadings matrix, times psi, the vector variance covariance matrix, times the transpose of lambda, right, so the transpose is shifting all the rows and columns, so then you would get like a long uh, matrix instead of a white one, or the other way around, plus the residual uh, variance corpus matrix. And this simple, well, not really simple, but this single expression uh, allows me to express every possible factor model that we can think of, every possible confirmatory factor model, using the same expression. And that allows us to get an implied uh, variance coverage matrix. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the parameters. So this lambda has some factor loadings, for example, in a way such that this thing closely resembles our observed variance coverage matrix S. So let's say we observe a covariance of uh, 0.3 between two items. We want to formulate a sigma that also has about a 0.3 covariance there between those two items but is structured according to the model that's implied by uh, the confirmatory effect analysis model. Now, to go a bit under the hood, technically, what, what do we mean with as closely as possible? That means that ideally, sigma equals s. But because sigma is made up of the amount of parameters, and s is made up of the amount of observations, when degrees of freedom are above zero, that means that sigma actually has less, it is a function of less unique elements than s, so it's not going to be exactly equal. But we want it to be closely equal. And I'll talk a bit more about that next week, about uh, the fitting of that. Under the hood, we define that with this function, and this is a very technical thing. Uh, what we do is we minimize this function here, f and ml. And uh, this is a function of the observed and the uh, implied variance coverage matrix. And this has trace, which is the sum of diagonal elements of S times the inverse of sigma minus the log determinant of S times the inverse of sigma minus the number of parameters. And this expression is actually um, uh, uh, corresponds with the um, likelihood ratio, and I'll talk more about that next week. Uh, what's important here is that in the perfect world where S equals sigma, so we have a perfect fitting model, then the inverse of S, sigma, is the inverse of S, and that means that here you get S times sigma inverse, and that's an identity matrix. Yeah? And then the trace is simply the sum of uh, an identity matrix, so that's a matrix with once in the diagonal. So that's a number of items, so that's actually P. So we get P here, we get P minus P here, 
the determinant of um, uh, of the density matrix will actually uh, be um, one in the log that is zero. So then we have uh, minus zero minus p, so we have p minus p, so that is uh, zero. So in the perfect fitting world, this thing is zero. And then uh, next week we're going to do a statistical test to see if this thing is, uh, uh, let's say, significantly uh, higher than uh, zero. So if we um, if you have the base uh, sigma on the sample, we get something that's not perfectly zero. Uh, but then we're going to see if that's uh, statistical significant or not. Now in any uh, SAM software, in any factor analysis software, this is what happens under the hood. Somewhere in the software code is this expression, where sigma is created in the way I showed in the previous slide, lambda psi, lambda trans plus plus theta. And there's an optimizer that chooses these parameters, such that this expression is as low as possible. And that's how you estimate your model. So in the assignment, I ask, actually ask you to do it yourself. Uh, or I show you a code and then show you how to run that. And that is just um, doing this. Right, so um, you don't have to uh, remember this uh, per se, but uh, this is what happens. So if you can implement this, then you basically have your own SAM software. The tricky part comes then in getting derivatives and stuff, but we don't really uh, go into that detail. Uh, this process of minimizing this fit function, which is uh, um, uh, equal to the log right uh, likelihood ratio, actually minus two times log likelihood ratio, log likelihood ratio. This is called maximum likelihood estimation. Because the parameters we get from this are the parameters under which the data was most likely. And I'll talk a bit more about that next week. Okay. So now that we all have all the technical stuff out of the way, let's go back to our examples. So instead of using um, these uh, uh, univariate expressions, we can use our multivariate expressions and we can use our matrices. So now we have this uh, one indicator model again. And let's say lambda here equals a matrix. It's simply a very simple matrix. It's a one by one matrix. Actually, everything here is a one by one matrix. So there's not much different happening. But it's a way to specify this model. So now we see sigma equals, and then we see two elements here, which is uh, not an identified model. Because we have one element here, but we have two here. For two indicators, we can now formulate our model using these matrices as well. So we have our lambda matrix, we have one factor loading that's constrained equal, and another one that's in there in the second element that we can estimate. We have a psi matrix, we have a uh, theta matrix, we have a sigma here, and this now has three elements, one, two, three, but it's constituted of four parameters, one, two, Three, four. So we have the degrees freedom of minus one. So we don't have an estimable model. So let's do three indicators, and now we are going to uh, be able to do things. So now we have three indicators, and we just use the same expression again. We always use the same expression, this uh, sigma, to uh, come up with our implied model. So we don't have to do this per variable anymore, we just use this, we fill in the matrices, we do sigma equals lambda psi lambda transpose plus theta. We get the sigma here, and that's uh, our expression for the implied variance covariance matrix. Now we have a 3 by 1 factor loading matrix, still a 1 by 1 uh, factor variance matrix, and a 3 by 3 uh, residual variance matrix. Uh, we have a sigma, it's uh, made up of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 elements. So we have three indicators. So P equals 3. And P times P plus 1 divided by 2 equals 6. So we have six observed uh, pieces of information as well. And how many parameters do we have? We have one factor variance. We uh, don't have this because we uh, scaled this to 1, so there's not a parameter we need to estimate. 
So we have a second and a third parameter in the factor loadings. And then we have a factor a residual variance for each indicator. So we have six parameters. So the degrees of freedom is six minus six is zero, which is good. So this means we have a identified model, which means that we can estimate these parameters, which is nice. The only downside is because we have exactly as many observed pieces of information as uh, parameters we need to estimate, is that we are going to get a model that's perfectly fixed. So our sigma is always going to be exactly equal to s in this case, because we have degrees of freedom is zero. And that's important. Often people in the course also, they uh, try out the data, they have three indicators, they get degrees of freedom is zero, they don't understand why, uh, or they get a fit of zero, perfect fit. And that's because of this, because you have uh, as many observed pieces of information as we have uh, parameters. So the real interesting stuff happens if you have more than this, more observed pieces of information that we model with uh, less parameters. So here, I have an example of two latent variables, eta1 and eta2. Now I added a covariance between them. There's a correlation between the latent variables, for example. And I have six indicators. So now these uh, uh, parameter matrices are structured in this way. We have this factor loadings matrix now has two columns and six rows where the first column contains the factor loadings of the first uh, uh, latent variable and the second column contains the factor loadings of the second latent variable. So those are these. The theta matrix is 6 by 6 and it contains all the residual variances on the diagonal. So how many observations do we now have? Well, we have P equals 6. So 6 times 7 divided by 2 equals, um, and I'm not really that great at math, so I'm just going to count these uh, elements here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So this should equal 21. <coughs> yes, that should be right. Uh, how many parameters do we have? Okay, we have one, two factor variances. We have a covariance. We have a factor loading here and here, not these, because we had to scale the latent variable. For each latent variable, we have to set one factor var uh, loading or the factor variance to one. We have these factor loadings, and then we have these residuals. 9, oh, 10, 11, 12, 13. So we have 13 parameters for 13 Greek letters in the model. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So our degrees of freedom equals 21 minus 13. And that equals 8, right? Yes, 8. So we have a identified model, which is great. And then we can do uh, more things. And basically, this is what factor analysis is all about. We just, uh, under the hood, usually the software you use, Alphan, you don't have to specify these matrices yourself. If you use the psychometrics package, which I made myself and which I'll also explain in the course, then you specify the model according to these matrices. But under the hood, this is what happens. We specify this model uh, under the hood that fills in these matrices. Then we fill in the expression before, and that's how we estimate the model. And this is what we're going to do in the course. The course is just basically this all the time. And then we're just going to fill these matrices in differently for different models. So now I added a residual correlation here. So maybe these are two items that are very similar to each other. Like this is, uh, let's say, uh, depression and this is uh, anxiety. And maybe these are both questions related to sleep problems. So we would expect them to correlate stronger than we expect due to the correlation of latent variance. 
then we can add this one parameter in the theta matrix. We get one less degree of freedom because we have one more parameter estimate. And the rest is just basically the same thing. We can also add a um, cross loading. So we can add a factor loading from one uh, uh, factor to another uh, indicator, for example. So now what we expected Y4, maybe now Y4 is the problem, and we expect to be a, a cost by both latent variables. Then we simply have one more parameter here to estimate. So we have one less degree of freedom. <clears throat> and that's all there is to it, really, to uh, confirm to effect analysis. And this is what the assignment will be about, is just looking at these kind of path diagrams, or being able to draw these path diagrams from a set of, uh, of matrices like this, or being able to write down these matrices, and then being able to compute the implied variance coherence structure given these matrices. Now, in the end, if you do want to obtain scores for the factor, which we don't do in this course, this is the only slide I have on this. But say you do want that, so maybe your goal in fact analysis is to form a scale, right? And then you make a scale and you give a questionnaire and you use fact analysis to validate that the scale is, uh, 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 that, that a latent variable could underlie these uh, items. And then you want to give it to people to use, and then you want them to have a score so that they can use it for a particular person to see what, what their latent variable is. So, um, what do you do then? Well, you can make the scale, and then uh, the uh, expected factor score, which I call theta hat here, is simply a weighted uh, sum score. So we take the weights minus the averages, and then we simply weight things, um, weight the items. All right. So normally, what people do is they take a sum score. And a sum score is a bad weighted version, right? But we can also do it better and do a, a weighted version. So we can say in our scale, okay, here, uh, if you want to get this factor score, then weigh this item two times, weigh this item two times. Now, the two ways to get these weights. First one is the regression method, and the second one is the Barlett method, Bartlett method, sorry. And they basically just use these factor, uh, these uh, model matrices in a different way to get this weights matrix, and both are heavily reliant on these factor loadings, of course, which uh, tell you the most about how good of an indicator an item is for weights. If you fill this in, you get a proxy of the latent variable. Now, the problem is that these proxies are never really that good. And you can also see that if you simulate data under a true latent variable, and you get them back using these factor scores, they're not great. And it turns out that we don't need them for many of the questions we want to answer as well. Like do groups differ on their means? We don't need these. So this is really only if you want to do something with your latent variable that you cannot do in SEM, uh, or if you want to use them individually in a scale. So we're actually never going to do this. Uh, but I included this slide uh, because in the first time I taught SEM, I didn't even teach this. And then people ask, okay, how do you get actually your latent variable? So if you want them, you can get them like this. Now, that's the basics of SEM1, actually. That's confirmed through effect analysis. If you have these matrices and you understand these uh, Greek letters and these Greek matrices and how sigma is formed, and you understand that what we do constantly is we form a model with a implied variance coverage structure, and then we try to get parameters such that that implied variance coverage structure is very similar to the observed variance coverage matrix, then you understand SEM1. And that's all we do in this course. In SEM2, we're going to take it one step further and also add structural effects between latent variables. So now we're going to test a mediation hypothesis, for example, that eta1 causes eta2 and that causes eta3, and there's no direct connection between eta1 and eta2. That's stuff you can do in SEM2, and then we can actually do a lot. There's a lot of different models that we can get from structural phase models. So confirm to effect analysis, the focus of SEM1, is a special case of SEM1, where we only have covariances between these latent variables, but no structural effects. Okay, and that's it for, um, for this lecture. So on Canvas, uh, the assignment will be uploaded uh, 
uh, on Tuesday at three o'clock. And in that assignment, um, you will look at these uh, matrices yourself and uh, look at uh, when is the model identified, when not, and um, do a very basic uh, estimation of parameters yourself before we start using software next week. Okay, um, that's it for this lecture. I'll see you in the Zoom slash chat meeting on uh, Thursday.